ladies and gentlemen, uh, we begin the planned session of the third day of the CTVUH 2011 World Conference in Seoul. I'm Young Yu Ju, uh, Secretary General of Seoul Organizing Committee. It's my great honor to chair the uh, plenary session. Today, we will have three honorable, distinguished uh, speakers. Our first speaker is William Patterson, design principal and co-founder of KPF. He was awarded Lean Bidder Lifetime Award from CTVUH. Recently, he designed the Lotte World Tower that was presented yesterday. Today, he'll talk about the social responsibility of tall buildings. Please welcome William Patterson with big hands. Good morning. That was uh, quite an evening last night, so uh, it, it's a pleasure to be here again with you. Uh, first, let me say that um, uh, it was just mentioned that uh, I was a designer of the Latte Tower. Um, my partner, Jamie Von Klemper, my partner, Trent Tesh, and Richard Nemeth were uh, all of the designers of that building. In our office, we have uh, each partner, design partner, has separate responsibility for their own projects, uh, yet at the same time we collaborate as a unit. But it's important, I think, that the, uh, the um, reference given to a project be accurately attributed. Um, I wanted to um, speak to you um, about some issues of the tall building that um, perhaps have not been uh, heavily emphasized uh, at the conference, uh, but have been a very important part of my uh, practice of the, uh, of the tall building. Uh, the tall building is by its own uh, very nature uh, insular and autonomous. It tends to want to stand alone. And uh, if this building type uh, is to be a successful component in the fabric of our cities. And as I mentioned last night, our cities have become now essentially just tall buildings. So if it's to become a successful component in the fabric of the city, uh, the building has to find ways of joining with others to be able to um, successfully create the urban fabric. I show you this slide and this image because for me it's an extraordinarily good example of urbanism. Um, the tall building um, is a vertical structure which is not unlike that of the human body. And the biology of the human body, of course, is a very specific thing. Um, and yet, the human body has a capacity to be able to gesture uh, responsively to every situation it finds itself in. Uh, and so, in a gathering of humans, the appropriate gestures are made by groups of individuals together. And for me, for a variety of reasons, this has been the most important focus uh, of my work on the tall building. And I say that because when we began our work in 1976, um, as unlike most architects who probably start with smaller structures and work their way up to, to bigger structures, um, my partnership with Gene Cohn and Shelley Fox enabled us to begin our practice working on the tall building. However, uh, we weren't asked to design tall buildings because we were considered great architects. Uh, we were asked to design tall buildings because uh, one, Gene knew a great number of people, and two, uh, because they felt that we would be responsive to their needs and to their requirements from financial perspective, from an urban perspective, uh, and so as a result, it was important then to start to develop a way of working with a tall building that can enable us to accomplish things 
from, if I could say, an artistic perspective, but at the same time, um, gradually start to gain a, a sense of, of uh, confidence with the building type such that it can contribute specifically to, to its environment. So one basically makes decisions early in one's career. And if one is to choose between the structural biology of a building and its social response, um, uh, my uh, initial decision was to, uh, and it wasn't that, uh, wasn't that clear cut, but my initial decision was to look at architecture of the, the architecture of the tall building through its social response. I uh, have now been working with the tall building for more decades than uh, perhaps I should admit to. Uh, now entering uh, the, my sixth decade working on the tall building. And uh, I wanted to show you uh, a bit of the history of the work that I've done here, uh, more to uh, sort of emphasize the, the contours of the work than anything else. In the, in the beginning as a student, that top line was all student work, I was almost entirely focused on the biology of the tall building. And the last image up on that first line uh, was a project that I did when I was with I.M. Pei's office, uh, which was an exoskeletal structure uh, ar around a cylindrical tube uh, and a building which um, was very much a product you know, of its, in its internal integrity. Uh, after we started our office in, in the 70s, then a building such as 333 Wacker Drive emerged in the 1980s. I wondered if cl the classical language might be uh, in some sort of abstracted way, a, a manner in which one could connect buildings in the urban fabric. The classical language was ideally suited to joining one piece to another because all elements of the classical language are shared by every building. And it was my aspiration that tall buildings could in fact somehow develop a language which would enable them to connect in the urban fabric and such uh, that one could reestablish qualities of the traditional fabric of cities that were lost by the introduction of tall buildings which were isolated and insular within the, in the urban fabric. Well, that was perhaps somewhat naive uh, because the unanimity of opinion and the fact that we would all join together in some sort of common uh, endeavor here in regard to the tall building and the language of the tall building was, uh, of course, not an achievable objective. Uh, and then through the, at the end of the, at the end of the 80s, uh, working on buildings in, in uh, fr uh, Frankfurt and, and, and uh, New York and then through the 90s, buildings that started to develop physical responses to their context in a way that uh, enabled them to connect uh, maybe more overtly to the context, but not through the language of the building as much. Uh, and then finally now th uh, to 2010. Um, conspicuously absent from this group of slides is a very important project uh, for me, um, we're working on the Hyundai Motor Headquarters here uh, in Seoul. And it was my um, hope to be able to show it to you today, but because of the fact that um, the city has not been able to act on the building yet in, in its approval, um, I, have, I have not able to show it to you, unfortunately. Um, and uh, hopefully with the new mayor, it will soon be approved and we will be able to, at the next conference, uh, show you that building. Because for me, um, it represents a connection between 1960 and today. It's really the first tall building that I've ever had the opportunity to fully develop the biology of the building uh, in a way where it and its urban responses can be joined together. And I think the, the tall building as it, is, as it evolves has to inevitably has to deal with its own internal biology uh, as a very important factor in its expression. But that internal biology, hopefully, like the human body, uh, can find a way to gesture to the specific context. And to be able to do both of these things with essentially a static object 
uh, is a huge challenge, but I think is one of the challenges which really faces us as the designers of tall buildings. Just wanted to show you um, a bit of my own personal sen sensibility. All of us, all of us have uh, our own inclinations as to what is beautiful. Um, for me, um, this is beautiful. Uh, I um, uh, have been an athlete. I've been an athlete all my life. <laughs> and I'm very much interested in the intersection between art and sport. Because I think the two things have a great combination. But when one looks at this particular image as a structural engineer, uh, I would imagine you would uh, immediately be drawn to the, the implications of this. Uh, as an artist, one was, is drawn to the implications of the energy that is represented uh, within this particular image. Um, as a designer of tall buildings, the connection to the earth and the manner in which the, the human body roots itself into the earth uh, is represented. The interaction between the curvilinear and the linear, which has been in, in a very important part of my aesthetic, uh, is represented here. So, it's not a very big jump uh, from uh, that image to th uh, this image, which is a, w a very well-known building that we did in the uh, late 70s, early 80s in Chicago on Wacker Drive. Uh, it gestures, obviously, to the river of Chicago. And when one is in Chicago, one understands the city a little bit better, I think, because of the relationship of this building to the river. Because when you can see it from a distance, you know what the river is doing. Uh, and the response it makes uh, to the river. And its juxtaposition of three elements, the, its base and its middle and its top is quite classical in its organization. It was an extraordinarily economical building, probably the least expensive building that we've ever done. Uh, and uh, so all of these factors uh, that I mentioned early is why we were selected as architects. Uh, we were selected because we could do economical buildings but hopefully economical buildings that could respond specifically uh, to a position. Another strategy for the design of tall buildings occurred to me um, in, in the, sort of in the end of the 80s. Um, I was very much interested in the finding of buildings, a way of a building gesturing to two different aspects of a context. So often a building will have a front and a back. Uh, it will have one context on one side and another context on another side. And I thought that uh, if there were a way of fusing together into a single structure, uh, a response to both of those contexts, which almost could have a very different sensibility. One could be, if one even think of the male-female relationship uh, of, of the building itself. But what is particularly interesting to me about this image is the, the holding of the hands. And so these buildings in this series of uh, uh, structures that were developed with this idea, uh, I call three-part buildings, where the first part is the core, which acts as a vertical stabilizer, and then the other two parts are able to gesture to the context. So th these are three buildings that were developed during that particular period, uh, one in Montreal, one in, in Frankfurt. And the third building is in uh, Hawaii, uh, the first Hawaiian bank, where it gestures to the sea on one side and to the mountains on the other, with a very diametrically opposed solidity versus transparency. And so the opposition of those two pieces is rather dramatically revealed uh, along the prow of the building itself. <coughs> if I were to select an image, well, I did select an image <laughs> of an inspiration for a tall building, uh, for me, uh, nothing has been accomplished uh, in art that represents vertical ascension uh, more beautifully than Brancusi's bird in flight. Um, it uh, is an image of enormous simplicity. And I believe that when one deals with the tall building, uh, the larger it and the taller it gets, uh, the more elegantly simple it ought to be. And the manner in which this particular object connects to the earth, the manner in which it, it reaches to the sky, 
um, is for me sort of an ideal. And three buildings that uh, have dealt with that, uh, two of which are built, uh, the Shanghai World Financial Center on the left-hand side, which was very much focused upon the connection of the earth to the sky. Uh, as a matter of fact, it really became the fusion uh, of a rectangular uh, a, 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 a square prism uh, and a circular uh, element, a cylindrical element, but not the one that was originally penetrating through the top of the building, but sort of a cosmic arc that actually carved then that uh, square prism. Uh, and so uh, after the, a, a great deal of, of political uh, uh, de uh, discussion, the, the evolution of the top of the building was changed to this trapezoidal form with a bridge going across the top of it. Uh, but still, the, the concept of the building of rooting itself heavily, uh, uh, heavily into the earth and then lightly in the sky uh, dominated, the, uh, dominated the response that the building makes. Um, in Hong Kong, uh, the building ICC is quite different. Um, Hong Kong, for me, when I look at the city, uh, looks like, almost like plant vegetation, uh, each year growing taller and taller. Uh, but it has this organic, marvelously organic quality uh, as it, it sits against the peak. And my original sense was if we were to design a building that is extraordinarily simple, possibly we could treat it as four individual sheaths that, that moved up almost like great leaves coming up from the earth. And so this building, as opposed to rooting itself into the ground, sort of opens itself as it comes to the ground and one is invited underneath it. Um, I had seen it during construction, but I took the, a, a, a trip to Hong Kong, my wife and I did just before coming here, um, mainly because I, I had seen photographs of the gesture which the building makes at the ground and the manner in which it receives one into it. And I wanted to be able to, 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 to visit it again to see it, how it was working with uh, the full occupation of the building. Uh, and so, as I referred uh, before, with the tall building, the simplicity of its form uh, seemed to me to be um, appropriate under the circumstances uh, where it could actually act as somewhat of an obelisk uh, at the entrance to the Hong Kong Harbor. We are doing a, a building in Qatar now uh, for the Kam uh, Kamal family, and it is um, a structure again of, of, of simplicity with a large aperture for um, uh, obvious reasons, but also programmatic reasons. Uh, and uh, that the, it, we have a hotel on the top of the building and it, it simply divides the residential units itself. Uh, but get, again, I think you can get a, a fairly good sense of the, uh, my own personal sensibility uh, as to uh, the nature of the building's form. I want to show you the uh, Samsung Electronic Headquarters here in Seoul uh, because it was a building or a group of buildings, uh, uh, tall buildings, that tried uh, very, uh, um, uh, in a very focused way uh, to create relationships to each other. We all talk about Rockefeller Center in New York and the beauty of the, the, the tall buildings, the, a grouping of tall buildings, of being able to talk to each other in a way. Um, we were told that uh, my curvilinear forms or my angular forms or whatever were not, uh, were re really appropriate for this particular task. Uh, this, this, they wanted rectangular, efficient floor plates. Uh, and so as a result, uh, this particular image, which is shows you a series of interlocking wooden blocks, and each of these wooden blocks having it sense a, a grain to them, became somewhat of an inspiration uh, for the manner in which these tall buildings were joined together. Now, I've talked about uh, the tall building and its ability to connect. Uh, it connects, inevitably, at three scales. It connects at the scale of the traditional city, which is usually stories, structures of about 10 stories in height. Um, 
to my way of thinking, the tall building has to be able to make some sort of reference if it's to join with the urban fabric. It has to be able to make a reference to that scale. And so you can see here with the, our th the three major buildings in the center, the dark blue representing the scale uh, of that height, which then weaves itself through uh, the entire complex. There is inevitably a mid-range scale, which uh, evolved, uh, you know, in the 40s and 50s of all cities. Uh, and that scale, too, I believe, ought to be referenced. Uh, and so, uh, as you can see here by this particular slide, uh, the manner in which our buildings then combine that scale uh, with the scale of the adjoining fabric. Uh, and then finally, there is the, the, the taller scale. Uh, these buildings are not that high in the range of 50 stories. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, that is a new scale that needs to be referenced within this sort of layered stratification of the city. Uh, so if tall buildings are to be able to connect to the city, my belief is that they have to find some way of making reference to that, unless, of course, they are so exceptionally tall that that reference would become meaningless. So uh, this is the final grouping of buildings with the interlocking parts of the, uh, the manner in which each of these parts then gesture out to each other, the manner in which they uh, try to talk to each other uh, in a dialogue very much inspired by that slide of Raphael's School of Athens that I showed you initially. Uh, the language of the building's facade uh, is one of striation. Uh, we uh, utilized a, a facade treatment which developed a narrow recess uh, the requiring a requirement of the operable window in Korean facades is a, is a difficult issue to deal with from an aesthetic perspective. And we placed these in the narrow recesses uh, and then used a translucent glass in juxtaposition to the clear glass. So we have a, a vertical grain, as you can see, and a horizontal grain. And the way these two then weave together is start to form the dialogue of the building itself and its, its manner of uh, connecting. And in, seen from internal, uh, internally, that vertical uh, treatment reads like this, and the horizontal treatment reading like that. Uh, and then in special zones of the building, uh, we have a series of atria that run up the west side of the, the uh, main uh, electronics headquarters, uh, and those are treated within a finer grain, more delicate grain. So altogether then, all of these pieces start to speak a language which allows them to connect, hopefully allows them to connect to nature, uh, and uh, d develops a scale uh, and an interest in, in bringing light down uh, to the below grade areas in penetration. Um, the transparency and translucency uh, give a lightness to the building, uh, yet at the same time, the buildings are massive structures, as you know, uh, and yet structures that are uh, I think, connected to nature. Finally, um, I um, had hoped to have the Hyundai building here in this position, but uh, uh, as a substitute, I'm taking a project that we're working on in New York City. This is almost like a news flash, I guess, because no one knows too much about the building, but and, uh, we, we don't even know that uh, the full story yet because uh, we're in the, in the middle of working on the project, and so we just took it off the boards to show it to you today. But it is very much interested in issues of, uh, of connection. I show you this particular image, West Side Story, because this is built over the train yards on the west side of New York. Um, one encouraging thing is it is nice to see a, a major project happening in the United States. And, and, uh, uh, while everything we've seen here at the conference, I believe, has been focused in Asia and the Middle East, uh, this does represent a level of optimism that uh, uh, we, uh, we have in New York now and which is in encouraging to us. But Leonard Bernstein's uh, great story uh, about the West Side uh, uh, based on Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet of two opposing forces in conflict with each other became somewhat of a theme for the development of this uh, 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 particular project, although I don't like to talk about that too much because developers don't seem to want us to talk about their buildings being in, in visual uh, conflict with each other. But uh, it, uh, one has to begin somewhere. Um, this is the site. Uh, it's a, a, now an abandoned rail yard. 
You've probably all gone past it. It's near the convention center. Um, on the slide on the left-hand side, it shows the Empire State Building. To the east of the site, it's a three-block wide site from 33rd Street down to 30th Street and goes all the way from 10th Avenue on the east all the way out to the Hudson River. So that's why we call it uh, Hudson Yards. Uh, but for us uh, as architects, uh, this represents a major opportunity to test the ability of tall buildings to create uh, a, a, a vibrant neighborhood in itself. We, um, our client, the related company, was given the, uh, won the development rights for the entire site. Uh, and they, uh, the site will be developed with about 10 million square feet of the building. We're doing the first phase. Uh, we're doing what is called the super block, uh, which involves a little bit over 5 million square feet uh, within it. So that uh, is the aspect of the project that I will address to you uh, today. The uh, interesting aspect of, of the uh, site's location, um, as it joins on the west side, um, the two communities of what was known as Hell's Kitchen, uh, d directly to the north of us, and Chelsea, which is now a very vibrant artistic community uh, to the south. And so the site is positioned directly between that uh, and then, of course, relates uh, to, to the Midtown. Um, recently, uh, this particular uh, transformation of the High Line, which was a structure which transported goods from the meatpacking industry all the way out to the, out to the river, um, was turned into a great urban park. Uh, it was d designed by Diller and Scofidio and has become um, perhaps one of the more um, well-known urban parks in the world. And it certainly has been an enormous attraction in New York City, totally unexpected uh, in, in terms of the numbers of people that it, it draws. Our site is at the very northern end of it. And the two phases of the High Line have been completed bringing that green line all the way up to the north. And our building then is directly at the end of the High Line as the High Line turns into an east-west orientation uh, and will become then a piece that actually goes underneath our building itself. So um, that, in, in, in conjunction with a, a master plan development that the city has done, developing a Hudson Boulevard and um, a, a park in association with all of this is the um, is sort of the context within which we are working. But it's a context that now uh, will only be developed uh, in, in the next 20 years. So everything you see uh, that's in dark gray up to the north of that is yet to be built. Uh, so we are in a position where we must initiate responses as well as respond itself. A program is a, a very simple one. Um, we have two office buildings, one of uh, two and a half million square feet and one of them a million and a half square feet. The one on two and a half is on the north, uh, the million and a half is on the south. Uh, we've tried to find ways of anchoring the corners of our site on the, the southeast and the northwest in such a way that we create all sort of these two polar uh, objects that which then enable the retail component to uh, fuse itself and flow between the, these, these two objects. Uh, all of this is still uh, under investigation and under design, but uh, the response here um, was again one of highly, a highly pragmatic nature. Uh, we were told that these office buildings have to be the most efficient buildings in New York City for marketing purposes. Now, what does that mean in New York City? Well, it means in New York City that the distance from the core to the outside wall needs to be 45 feet. And that dimension needs to be maintained all the way up the building. So the potential for doing buildings that uh, take on all sorts of uh, different form uh, is really limited. But one thing from its basic biology, and it's pretty straightforward stuff, as the one moves up the building, the cores start to drop, the elevator shafts drop off. And so from the dropping off of the elevator shaft, one then has the ability to be able to, if one keeps the same level of dimension from the core to the outside wall, enables the building then to taper back. And so that becomes one of the first formal gestures. 
Uh, secondly, by positioning the two buildings in an opposing way uh, on the southeast and the northwest, one, one has the ability then to face the city uh, with one structure and face the river with the other, and the way that the two work together, uh, and not in opposition, but, but hopefully in dialogue, uh, can become a, a, an important generator uh, for the dynamic of, it, of the space in between, because the space in between is then implied as a center uh, which is being held by these two other objects that are gesturing on either side. And so as we then develop uh, further uh, the, the, the site plan, the response now to the high line as one comes up from the south, the um, response of the building now becomes uh, one where uh, the building on the, on the lower portion of the slide is the building on the south. Uh, it receives the high line as the high line comes up. Now, our first client was introduced uh, into the project. The first potential tenant of the building was introduced well along in the design process. So they looked at it and they said to us, well, the buildings are interesting enough, but we really want to be able to create, and this is coach, uh, uh, we want to be able to create a campus uh, for our, our um, uh, institution or our, our, our company. Well, uh, creating a campus within a singular tall building uh, presented some initial difficulties, but uh, the, the thought came that if we actually create a fissure through the building itself and fault one of the elements out, pull it out from the structure, uh, enhancing its ability to gesture and scale to that mid-rise scale, we could create then an atrium between the two pieces that could respond to the axis of the high line. And so that's what was done. And in addition, we created these inner shields which allowed the buildings to talk more directly to each other. Uh, one of the interesting com components of the, uh, of the high line uh, uh, continuation is that little segment that you see in the left-hand corner, it's by Diller and Scofidio. Again, they're going to be doing what is called a culture shed, which is going to be a beautiful expanded structure which moves in and out. Again, a piece which starts to form a dialogue with our building itself. And, and so that becomes then the image from the south, potentially. We, we're shingling the surfaces much like we did on ICC uh, of the major vertical aspects of the tower, trying to a gesture at the corners to allow the building to respond to each of its individual corners, uh, creating the fissure of the atrium between, and then allowing then the, the, the spur of the high line to move underneath the building uh, with this rather substantial uh, uh, arcade that is created between the two. So it, it just as uh, to give you a sense of how that atrium works, you're looking right down the axis of the high line out towards the Statue of Liberty. Uh, so the potential for this space, uh, when we finally design it, uh, hopefully is going to be an interesting one. Um, again, you see how the two buildings gesture to each other and create the, the implication of space in between. Um, and uh, from the north, uh, the taller of the two buildings anchoring the corner on the northeast. Uh, and as the buildings then are seen, as one moves around them, uh, hopefully, they create almost a, a dance as one can move around the buildings themselves, uh, looking extremely uh, uh, different from each uh, visual angle pers perspective. And that is about all I can tell you about that story, because that's as far as we are. There's a lot more to tell. Maybe I'll tell it to you next time. But thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh. Thank you for, for your great